Wow. Amazing stuff. This is an amazing review we got at Heart and Soil from Katya. Now you made me believe in unicorns and fairy dust. Smiley face. I had tenosynovitis in my wrist since March, 2022. Very painful thing. Tried acupuncture, physio, massage, osteopathic treatment, vitamins, anti-inflammatory supplements, herbs, celery juice, you name it. Went carnivore-ish for four weeks. That is animal-based. Added this skin, hair, and nails supplement from Heart and Soil, and the pain is gone. It is gone, you guys. Back to full-on yoga practice. Very stoked. We'll try all your other products. Not sure what's the best way to mix and match them. Thank you so much. Uh, in answer to Katya's question, you can mix and match the supplements however you'd like. A lot of people take two or three different supplements with six of capsules of each of them per day. If you're taking more than that, you can rotate the supplements. You can always email us, Radical Health at heartandsoil.co if you need any help or have any questions about how to construct a carnivore or animal-based diet, the team will help you out and we can make recommendations about which supplement might be best for you or how to combine what we make. But at Heart and Soil, we are clearly making the best, the finest grass-fed, grass-finished, regeneratively raised, desiccated organs on the planet. Check us out at heartandsoil.co and reclaim your birthright to radical health. I'm so proud of what we do at Heart and Soil. So this week's podcast is Sally K. Norton, who has done an amazing amount of research and health education in the realm of oxalates. This is a topic that I have not talked about a lot recently. It's something I talked about in the very beginning of my carnivore journey on the podcast many years ago, but I wanted to have Sally back on to really refresh this topic in the minds and hearts and ears of all the listeners. Sally has a Bachelor of Science in Nutrition from Cornell University and a Master in Public Health from UNC Chapel Hill. She managed a five-year NIH-funded program at the UNC Medical School directed at uh, educating students and faculty about holistic, alternative, and integrative healing. And as I said, she has personal experience and a lot of research experience about oxalates. So it was fun to have this conversation with her. Uh, they clearly are, in my belief, a major problem for humans, something to be aware of. And in this podcast, we talk about where they're found, what it actually is, what kind of symptoms you might experience if you have oxalate overload, how to mitigate this, and how to make them uh, a minimal part of your diet. It's basically impossible to eliminate them completely, but uh, I think you can eliminate them or minimize them to such a low extent that your body can handle them. But this is actually a really interesting, shocking topic that many of us are aware of in the realm of kidney stones, but very, very rarely gets talked about. So please enjoy this podcast with Sally Norton. And if you like this podcast, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, that is where we really move the needle. Um, and then so as a thank you to everyone who leaves me a review there, I'll be giving away one signed copy of my book every month to people who leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for that, guys. And on to the podcast with Sally K. Norton. Enjoy this one, guys. Sally Norton, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you back. You were one of the first guests on the Fundamental Health Podcast over three years ago when I started this podcast. I wore my, my kale is bullshit shirt in honor <laughs> of this podcast. I need to find one that says uh, chard is bullshit. <laughs> that might be more appropriate. But we're going to dive into oxalates. It's something we haven't talked about a lot on the podcast, and there's no better person to, to, get, uh, to get mucky in the oxalate mire with than you. Um, I thought maybe we would start with the story of Liam Hemsworth. You want to tell us what happened with Liam Hemsworth? I'll bring up some articles I found to screen share for people who are watching the video. But w what happened to, to Liam Hemsworth yeah, a few years ago? He, he, um, you know, he got married to a vegan and got encouraged by a world. You know, in the celebrity world, it's very popular right now to go plant-based and vegan. And it's all virtuous. And, and he was doing a great job. He was really trying hard. He was very sincere doing smoothies multiple times a day with spinach as the major ingredient. And he missed out on his, he'd done this movie recently. It was like, I think January of 2019. Isn't it romantic? And he missed his movie premiere and he missed an awards banquet. Two really major things you do when you're a movie star. And he missed them because he was in the hospital having kidney stone surgery. Thanks to his smoothie. <laughs> And it turned out he didn't get a lot of information from his doctors about wh why this was happening to him. He's a young man. He's fit. You know, he's got everything in life going for him. And he's in the hospital having surgery. 
And he actually found my website, which gave him a clue about what was the real issue. That's amazing. I'll screen share a couple of interesting articles that are related to this. Um, uh, Liam Hemsworth said his vegan diet gave him a kidney stone. Here's how that's possible from Insider. And lo and behold, his kidney stone appears to have been calcium oxalate kidney stone, and it probably was caused by all these smoothies that were super rich in oxalates uh, and foods like spinach, potatoes, nuts, and chocolate, which we're going to dive into today. And then interestingly, um, you know, he uh, ended up eventually reaching out to me too. Uh, we were never able to get him on the podcast, and I haven't spoken to him in a while. Instagram did me the favor of deleting my old Instagram, so I don't know if I can get in touch with him anymore. But a couple of years ago, he reached out and he said, hey, man, the carnivore diet really helped me. Or He basically went from vegan to mostly carnivore or partially carnivore and was loving it. And I was talking to him every once in a while, and he was doing, I suppose, Liam Hemsworth things. So it was really cool. But um, I think that uh, that that the virtue signaling in Hollywood and Miley didn't did a number on poor poor Liam. Interestingly, I also saw that, um, that Miley is no longer a vegan. Uh, Miley Cyrus reveals she quit her vegan diet for health reasons. She was running on empty, the quote says. So I thought that was uh, kind of ironic also, right? I think she talked about that on she, Rogan's podcast. She probably does have oxalate related issues. She complains about hip pain and she complains about loose joints. And those are common issues affiliated with high oxalate in the body. And so, I really think a lot of entertainers get into funny diet styles that can get them into high oxalate by mistake because no one is thinking about oxalate. No one is aware. Most people have never even heard the word. They don't realize that 80% of all kidney stones are made of calcium oxalate. Your doctors call it calcium. And so they never hear the word oxalate. So they don't ever get any clues. I've had plenty of clients who even young women and it used to be that kidney stones were considered a disease for 80-year-old guys. Um, but I know one of my clients, she started getting kidney stones as a 12-year-old, something like that, because she went vegan as the 7-year-old. And they never, she was hospitalized three times with renal shutdown. And the doctors just shrugged their shoulders. They don't know, they don't know. They, it never occurred to them to ask them about her diet. I mean, to ask her what she ate. But do you think that even if they had asked her what she ate, that they would have connected the dots? Because I never heard the word oxalate other than calcium oxalate kidney stones in my entire medical training. Not as two years as a PA, four years working in cardiology as a PA, four years of medical school, four years of residency at the University of Washington. The only time anyone said oxalate was calcium oxalate kidney stone. And perhaps if you do get a calcium oxalate kidney stone or you're a recurrent calcium oxalate kidney stone former, they might give you a low oxalate diet sheet, which might begin to unearth some of this. But never was I taught in medical school, these are high oxalate foods. I think you had to be in nephrology to even go down that rabbit hole. And even there, you know, the guys who are running the protocols now, like how to prevent the next kidney stone, they've dropped the low oxalate diet off of that. Really? Shocking. <laughs> what do they recommend? Just more calcium? You know, low salt, <laughs> drink a ton of water. All my urinary tract clients have been told to just drink pools of water every day. Like that's going to be dilution is the solution to pollution kind of mentality. And, you know, that has all of its other problems of trying to force people to overconsume water as a solution. Here we go. Hyponatremia, right? I, I think that that's, that's, that's sort of the, the truism now, though. You're not drinking enough water. Well, probably most people are drinking plenty of water. You could look at a, a specific gravity of your urine to get a sense of that or a, you know, urinary sodium, perhaps, or something. You know, there's plenty of ways to see what your hydration status is looking at a simple urinalysis. I don't think that most people are that dehydrated that they're forming well, they're kidney stones. they're spending money on bottled water left and right. <laughs> we, we drink like four times more bottled water than beer and coffee. Like we're drinking more pre-plastic bottled water than coffee. So people are drinking water. They're drinking water. I mean, everybody has a water bottle now. I don't think it's dehydration that's causing this. So, but you you touched on this a little bit. So let's. But I want to say one thing about Liam, and then we'll we'll talk about the symptoms of oxalate issues, and then we'll dig into what oxalates are, where we find them, etc. So it's important to know that 
Liam Hemsworth has no pre-existing conditions that we know of that predispose him to kidney stones. He hasn't had Rue NY gastric bypass, which leads to fat malabsorption. We'll probably talk about that later in the podcast, why that can lead to increased absorption of oxalates. Um, but there, there are many cases, there are case reports of serious kidney failure, which we'll probably talk about in this podcast, when people do these green smoothie cleanses. And the most widely talked about one is a woman with sort of a predisposition to hyperabsorb oxalates because of this fat malabsorption related to Rue and Y gastric bypass, which is a procedure where they, they move the, they take the, they make a blind loop out of the jejunum, I believe, and move it up and attach the stomach further down. And it, it creates this sort of pouch and people get malabsorption. It's barbaric. Of, if yeah, you it's look, totally barbaric. If you yeah. look at the rerouting, it's like, it's amazing anyone signs up for have that done to themselves. It's crazy. And when I was in medical school, yeah. people are really looking for an out from a life that's not working. It's really sad. And when people have Rue NY gastric bypass, they often get B12 deficiency and all sorts of other malabsorption. So it's, it's, a, it's what it's designed to do. Exactly. It's meant right. to starve you of nutrients so you don't stay fat. <laughs> that's one of the ways it works. Yeah. And then you end up with oxalate hyperabsorption. So, okay, so let's just understand that Liam Hemsworth, green smoothies every day, probably had some almonds, probably had some kale, probably had some spinach, probably had some chard. Uh, maybe I can get a hold of him and ask him exactly what was in his smoothies, but not uncommon smoothies that would make uh, Rhonda Patrick very proud, um, <laughs> you know, have caused this otherwise healthy individual with no known primary hyperoxaluria, no known genetic predisposition to anything uh, to have kidney stones. So that's just the baselines here. But you touched on some of the symptoms and I was reading some excerpts from your upcoming book, which I'm looking forward to. And, and in it, you kind of go through, let's just give people the laundry list of symptoms. And the caveat here is these are nonspecific, right? Just because you have one of these symptoms doesn't necessarily mean you have oxalate toxicity. My point in having you enumerate these is that people understand that, that it's a wide swath of things that can potentially be related to excess oxalates in the body. Yeah. So you want to go through some of the symptoms of oxalate poisoning? Yeah. So the thing is, oxalate's a tiny little chemical, and we start absorbing it from the foods we're eating right there in the stomach. And already in 40 minutes, you've already got elevations of oxalate in the bloodstream. And then there's a long period of, of food moving through the intestinal tract where it's continuing to, to move from food into your bloodstream. We call that absorption, right? So oxalate starts intermingling with your vascular system, which includes these cells that line your capillaries and your veins and arteries, but also the, the cells in your blood. Your blood is full of white cells and red cells, and they're also intermingling with oxalate. Oxalate is this little chemical and it manages to get into cells in ways it's not, they don't fully understand. We expect that a water soluble ion, which oxalate is, is being transported by ion exchangers and probably it is to a great deal but it seems to also just kind of get there and sign like they can't always explain how it's getting there but already you could be affecting the mitochondria in your white blood cells and causing inflammatory distress in your immune system just from eating it just in that first hour after a meal even though it takes about five hours after your meal where you get the highest peak of, of concentration of oxalate in the bloodstream and then it's, it's about an eight to 10 hour tail. So during that, you know, five to eight hours after meal, you're more likely to see some acute symptoms and often you don't notice them, but it could be things like trouble falling asleep because five hours after dinner is when you're going to bed. For me, it was hiccups. I mean, it was causing electrochemical changes in my nerves and causing spasms in the diaphragm. So you can get arrhythmias, you can get all kinds of funny muscle behaviors, which, which can affect motility of the colon. So you can you often end up with some form of dismotility in the colon, either constipation or diarrhea or some weird combination of both. Uh, but generally things are off and regulation is off. Now, the cells that get oxalate, especially if the oxalate starts crystallizing, because oxalate will start taking minerals from the blood in small level, you know, small degree of calcium will start binding with oxalate ions. Lowering your electrolytes in your blood, especially calcium, can affect the workings of the pacemaker. Some people actually get arrhythmias just from a high exposure to oxalate, or also later on, if your body starts accumulating this oxalate, because the, the amount like Liam was eating in, in these smoothies is 
way higher, you know, nine, maybe even 15 times higher than what our kidneys are designed to handle. And that overload forces a sort of sequestration process where the body starts collecting oxalate in order to keep your blood and heart working. Because you, you must you must keep the heart happy if you're going to be a smart body and live a long time. You don't let the blood get so messed up with your electrolytes that your heart's going to fail. So there's a lot of sacrifice that goes on in the short run to keep things happy when oxalate's running around the bloodstream. And in the long run, you end up with a perpetual donation of electrolytes, especially calcium, from the bones. So you turn up inflammation in the bones and you start depleting the whole body of minerals and eventually that'll show up as osteopenia or osteoporosis. But the funny part about that is you might also have a bone density scan that shows high density because if their oxalate and forming calcium oxalate is starting to collect in the body. It often migrates to the bones because there's so much calcium there and the bone marrow. So in the bones, you might have little bits of basically quartz, which is harder than bone. So often with an oxalate poisoning, you might see a mixed scan where one part of the body has osteopenia and another part is excessively hard because it's got contaminants. You might also see lowered white blood counts because if oxalate's collecting in your bone marrow, you may have trouble producing enough white cells. Also, that damage to the, the bloodstream may cause cells to die sooner. And it also affects red cells. You can lose red cells because oxalate connects to various enzymes. There's at least four enzymes that have been demonstrated in the research where oxalate sits on the active part of the enzyme. So an enzyme is what facilitates reactions that produce energy in the body. So the body has these energy pathways called glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. Well, the last step in glycolysis requires an enzyme that oxalate blocks. And in red blood cells, you don't have mitochondria. You have to have glycolysis to produce these ATPs. When oxalate is blocking that enzyme, you have low energy in the cell. Those Missing energy molecules means the pumps that control the ions in the cell slow down and don't work as well. There's a, a sodium pump, an ATP sodium pump in a red blood cell that has to keep the sodium pushed out of the cell. But when there's not enough ATP because there's too much oxalate around blocking the enzyme, cells fill up with water because the sodium is getting stuck in the cell and the cell explodes or bursts. So you get what we call hemolytic anemia. All right, so from, there's several ways in which oxalate can mess up your blood cells and create vascular inflammation. And all of the oxalate that moves from your food into your body goes straight to the liver. Everything we eat gets filtered into the liver. The liver is designed to handle oxalate, but it does have to use a lot of glutathione to protect itself after a spinach smoothie. And over time, your liver could be depleted in glutathione. You can end up with chemical sensitivity and, and just funky things with your liver. You can't really drink alcohol and, you know, things like that. Where your liver is starting to struggle. And then it, the, the oxalate moves from your liver to your heart. It's only a couple inches from your liver to your heart. And then the, the heart's going to pump that oxalate into the lungs for oxygen and then back into the heart. So there's a, no clearance. of so The body hasn't removed any of the oxalate. It's just pulled it into the bloodstream and your organs of critical life, essential organs, your liver, your heart, and your lungs get fully exposed to all this oxalate that you're eating. So there's, those are areas where you're likely to see inflammation, damage over the short term and the long term, and um, wear and tear that you don't want from oxalate. Oxalate is messing with the cell membranes. It, especially when the crystals start forming in those tissues or in the blood, the, the, there's two leaves in a membrane. There's an inner and an outer leaf of fat, right? Well, the certain fats that should be on the inside start flipping to the outside and you change the structure of the membranes because of the electromagnetic toxicity of the oxalate. Once you mess up your membranes, all kinds of things can happen in any tissue because membranes are where your biochemical reactions are occurring. And that can start influencing 
every aspect of cell metabolism. It's definitely stressing out the mitochondria, which is a double membrane structure. And when the mitochondria are now stressed and getting leaky, again, it's another way that cell energy is lowered. And the more you have low cell energy, the more the free radicals start accumulating in cells. And then that bring, turns up inflammation in the body. And you end up with a condition of chronic inflammation because there's chronic cell stress going on. And literally any tissue in the body can be impacted by vascular stress and cell stress and low cell energy. So it can really lead to all kinds of things. So you mentioned things like joint pain, neurologic symptoms, insomnia. So it can affect the brain. It can affect neurons, arrhythmia, potentially um, digestive issues, either constipation or diarrhea. I want to ask you about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and um, sort of, uh, you know, damage to the myenteric plexus in the gut as well, perhaps, uh, potentially energy things. Um, you know, you sent me a video of people who are talking about experiences when they worked with you and they were describing things like pain, fatigue, fibromyalgia potentially could be related to this. So there's a lot of different symptoms that people could experience with regard to oxalates is what I'm hearing here. And what I find yeah. so interesting that there's a, it's a really vast array, but I want people to understand the breadth of that. And it, you can simplify it to like, okay, your GI tract likely to have an issue, both pre and post oxalate damage. Like the more GI problems you're having, often from plant toxins like lectins and oxalates together, if you're eating a lot of undercooked beans, you know, like that are slow cooked in a slow cooker, like I did, I wasn't smart enough with a nutrition degree from Cornell to know not to do that. <laughs> you can do stuff like that. And, you know, that increases how much gets into the blood. Because when you're healthy, you're only supposed to absorb somewhere between 10 and 15%. But any kind of permeable gut issue, any kind of gut inflammation, which is another reason why the, the gastric surgeries increase oxalate absorption, because you end up in, with a kind of a chronic gut inflammation problem with those surgeries, you can absorb as much as 67% of the oxalates you're eating. So even if you're not a spinach smoothie or a keto bread person, just your standard diet that has the occasional French fries and a little bit of chocolate here and there and this and that. It's 67%. That's really massive difference in how much you're absorbing. So, but we, you can think of it as like digestive plus neurological. You have to understand neurological means a lot of things because nerves run muscles, nerves let you sleep, nerves let you remember things, nerves give you coordination, nerves affect your mood. So it could be everything from anxiety, lack of motivation, lack of clarity about what your goals in life are. All of that could be signs of neuroinflammation and oxalate is very much implicated in that kind of stuff. And then you have this connective tissue concern. Connective tissues tend to collect oxalate where you get crystals forming in joint spaces and bones and so on. But also oxalate starts because of the energy effects on tissues, affects connective tissue maintenance. And so the connective tissues start becoming weaker and weaker and less able to really do their jobs. So all kinds of pain syndromes can come out of any combination of the, of the inflammation of the nerve damage and nerve dysfunction, as well as connective tissue weakness and dysfunction, as well as having little crystals in your body, the immune system is really not liking that. And that's really the equivalent of having asbestosis, having little crystals of oxalate collecting and forming in tissues all over the body. Like the raphides. Well, the raphides are a specific shape that plants build Plants deliberately construct calcium oxalate crystals for various purposes that they're still figuring out. And one of them is that double pointed toothpick shape called rapide that is made into like quiverfuls of like 200 of them in a bundle in a vascular vacuole in a plant cell. And the plants literally, when you damage the plant tissue, the plants literally project these little arrows and they're capable of, of penetrating two cells deep. So in plants that are really thick and heavy with these rapides and oxalate, you can end up in the hospital from a drop of plant sap from these really toxic plants that we consider poisonous. But it's the same stuff that's in a kiwi. Right. And the kiwi <laughs> maybe doesn't make the rapides, but the different bakia. Actually, the kiwi makes <laughs> rapides. They're just in a pectin bubble surrounding the seed. 
And so uh -huh. that pectin bubble kind of protects us from direct contact in the mouth and throat. So you don't feel it until, unless you have some kind of enzymatic power to break down pectin, which is a soluble fiber. Um, but you're still eating basically microscopic glass shreds. And I've heard you talk about Diffenbachia, the one plant that has the raphides that kind of like shoot out, like a drop of Diffenbachia sap can cause somebody's yeah. whole mouth and throat to become inflamed and raw. There's several cases in the literature, including one with pictures. One guy, he spent nine days in the hospital. The first four or five days, he couldn't speak at all. They call Diffenbachia dumb cane because it paralyzes the vocal cords. And so that's the oxalate doing that. And it's the combination of your immune system responding to the assault from the crystals and the soluble oxalate and the proteases and other things that are in raw plants. Uh, it's not, and then your immune system is just trying to defend you and it gets a little overzealous. <laughs> so much to dig into here. I want to highlight a few things before we dig into the foods that have oxalates and talk about why plants use them and how they're using them as another defense chemical. But I wanted to ask you, what is the enzyme in glycolysis? Is it pyruvate dehydrogenase? Which yeah. is the one that's affected by... Yeah, yep. it's the one from the last step. Yeah, that sounds right. I, I don't always trust okay. my own oxalate damaged memory <laughs> <laughs> to remember all the enzymes. And I could have had them listed here. Uh, but yeah, it's it's these pyruvate converting or, uh, enzymes that are most likely to be... It's pyruvate dehydrogenase. There's, I wish I had the list of them for you. I think but that the that, last that, step in glycolysis is getting blocked. That's when you get the juice out of the whole deal and it's broken. Exactly. And it's then I wanted allosteric to... interference. It sits there as if it is the little pyruvate molecule. Exactly. And I wanted to emphasize something that you said, which was um, that, uh, well, as I'm looking here, it says the last enzyme is pyruvate kinase. So oh, we'll maybe see. that's the one. Yeah. Maybe it's pyruvate kinase. Okay, yeah. pyruvate kinase might be the last step in glycolysis. Mm -hmm. um, shame on me for not remembering that either. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they make it go over and over and over again, and yet... <laughs> I know. Um, but I, I thought you said something that was <clears throat> very interesting. You said that by eating foods that are high in oxalate, we, we may provide, we may create some stress on the liver, and that can deplete glutathione, which is a master antioxidant, a three amino acid antioxidant that I've talked a lot about. And this is sort of a molecular policeman that goes around controlling reactive oxygen species, usually by donating an electron or by, you know, reducing a free radical. Um, uh, oxidation is loss of electrons, gain of electrons is reduction. Leo, the lion says, Gur, those are critical sort of biochemical processes. Everybody who should know who's thinking about oxidation and reduction, who wants to understand what antioxidants do. But you said that spinach could cause oxidative stress. No question about it. It does. And, you know, uh, we have all kind of drugs and, and kind of like fix-it molecules are mostly create a sort of toxic experience for the body intended to turn on the body's own natural defenses and, and where your body kind of creates a, a brief inflammatory but then a, a stronger anti-inflammatory secondary response and so you might get this feeling of well-being from these drugs, this oxalate drug that's in a spinach smoothie, but it's only because your body is appropriately responding, at least in the short run. It doesn't last long. And, and then there's whole other reasons why you might get confusing signals from your body about what diet is working for you or not, which I hope we'll get into. Yeah, so this is the NRF2 system. I've talked about it recently. I did a controversial thoughts uh, last week about uh, KEEP1 and NRF2 in response to turmeric and specifically curcumin in turmeric, which activates NRF2, the same mechanism. This is the same thing I've talked about in the past, guys. Sulforaphane, curcumin, oxalates, they, if they're going to create oxidative stress, they might turn on NRF2 by dissociating it from KEEP1, and that is a pro-oxidant. So I just think it's ironic that you walk into the grocery store and everybody looks at the spinach and says, oh, that's a great antioxidant. Or they look at turmeric and they say, that's a great antioxidant, when in fact, it's kind of a pro-oxidant. And there is a bodily response to that, which is a hormesis. But as I've talked about in separate videos, and I won't go down the rabbit hole here, there are always side effects to these plant molecules. And the side effects to oxalic acid are many as we're enumerating. But it is important to understand that, that spinach in, in many ways is a pro-oxidant and it can deplete glutathione in, in 
in that respect as well, as can curcumin in, in the same way. And curcumin is yet another food that is very high in oxalates. People don't often eat um, large quantities of curcumin, but if you are taking tablespoons of turmeric and putting them in your smoothie with spinach, you are having a lot of oxalates. And I, I talked about that in the curcumin video as well. Um, I also love to throw almonds in there, but exactly, there's right? a real difference between whole root turmeric, which is terribly high in oxalate, and curcumin extracts, which many of them have very little oxalate, because the oxalate can get separated in these separation processes that we do, and sometimes very processed things are much lower in oxalate, like, you know, potato starch has like no oxalate, but potatoes are quite high in oxalate, kind of equivalent to beets. Yes, beets are another food. So I had this thought as I was refreshing my memory on oxalates for this podcast, when I go into a Whole Foods in the United States, there's like this sense of calm, right? It's this nice store. And, and I think that as humans who are very far removed from our wilderness ancestors, from the Hadza, for instance, or any hunter-gatherer tribe, you know, it's been, for most of us, it's been tens of thousands of years since we were, since our ancestors were in a forest uh, picking up plants and choosing whether to eat this leaf or that fruit or go hunt this animal or that mushroom or this mushroom. And so I think that, if we think back to that level of human existence or that time in human existence, it's not crazy to imagine that there are many plants that are toxic, that are frankly toxic and will kill you if you eat them. Things like sorrel. If you eat too much sorrel, you will die because of oxalate toxicity. So hunter-gatherer tribes, people that live in the wilderness know this and they don't overeat these foods. But when we walk into Whole Foods, we sort of imagine that like everything in there is good for us, right? It's all packaged and it says it's an antioxidant and they have the ORAC rating for, for kale. And I mean, kale is hailed as a panacea and, and chard is just like, it's, it's really, it's wonderful cousin. And, you know, the more greens you eat, the better. So you're walking into Whole Foods. And what, what strikes me is that the more you learn about plants, specifically the parts of plants that are high in things like lectins or oxalates, which are often the same parts of plants, the leaves or the seeds or the roots, you realize that like that whole vegetable section of, of, of whole foods is literally like a minefield. There are some plant leaves that are lower in oxalates than others, but there are absolutely bombs in there. So in, in this, despite the fact that the whole produce department is a human invention in an attempt to make plants edible, because really, if you go in the wilderness, there's almost nothing there to eat unless you're a hunter. And the produce department, everything was an invention. I mean, the original tomato was a bitter little fruit the si less than the size of a cherry. You know, and, and the 400 varieties of potato were developed in Peru over a long period of time. And when it was introduced to the human diet in the Western world, like 400 years ago, people didn't want to eat that stuff. You had to have lots of butter on hand and salt to make it edible. And so now we make it into French fries and potato chips to make a potato edible because it's fundamentally not that interesting until you dress it up with what we really want. <laughs> and it's also full, those are all full of these oxalates. So yeah. take us through. So like, say you and I are walking into Whole Foods and, and we go into the vegetable aisle, like walk me through the foods that you, that you and I are going to see that are going to be the worst in terms of oxalates. And we can walk all the way around Whole Foods virtually if you want, but I think we should take people through yeah. a tour of Whole Foods and say, these are all the foods that are super high in oxalates that you really need to know about. Well, often they'll put the most perishable and profitable products right at the front door next to the fancy cheese just to make it look good. And that's often whatever berry is in season and the blackberries and the raspberry are very high in oxalate. Strawberries, are, have measured all over the map. They can go anywhere from like one to 24 milligrams per big fat strawberry. So the strawberry is like, you have no idea how much oxalate is in it. And that's the thing about plants is they make oxalate according to growing conditions and genetic tendencies and all of this stuff. So we can't always know how bad that food or isn't bad. And so that that's a, a, can be a problem when you're trying to control exactly how much oxalate you eat. But so there's a couple of fruits like that. Kiwi are high, clementine are high. Let's see, what else would be the fruits? Um, figs are high. We used to grow them in our yard. Many of the pears are pretty high. Lemon zest is high. And we're running into the fall holiday season here in the U.S. And things like the one of the pies we do at Thanksgiving is minced meat pie, which has a lot of 
zest, you know, like citrus peel in the mincemeat. And same with Christmas fruit cake is all citrus peel. And we love to put orange peel and lemon zest into teas in, during the winter time. And that makes it all great. And the cinnamon is a little high too, although it's more the crystals than the soluble. So then they've got the greens. There's really only three or four greens to be worried about. And that is spinach. And what's even worse than spinach is beet greens. And what is the same as beet greens is Swiss chard. It's basically the same plant. Swiss chard just doesn't make a beet, but it's literally the same plant. Those are worse than spinach. And I used to live on Swiss chard because I grew it since I was a kid. And then there's sorrel, which is popular with chefs and popular in Europe and some places in South America. It's not so big in the U.S. Uh, but really, if you could just let go of spinach and Swiss chard and beet greens, you'd be really doing well. But the beetroot is also high and beetroot is flying high right now. It's like, just like turmeric, it's gonna save you from everything. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, whatever beet might do for you, Asana would do just as well, or if not better, because Asana restores the enzyme that allows you to make nitric oxide. So just make your own by taking Asana. Side note. I love that. <laughs> Back in the produce department, potatoes. The russet potato that we use to make fries and we tend the baker potato that we'll put our chili on top of or whatever, those are really high in oxalate, similar to beets. Um, the, the other potatoes tend to be a little bit lower, but you can still get yourself in trouble. Potatoes tend to be addictive and people get hooked on them. Tomatoes, when you concentrate them into spaghetti sauce, get pretty high. Uh, plantain is now a thing. It's mm -hmm. probably there in Costa Rica, it's a thing, but now it's a thing here. And plantain is now in also in chips, but these sort of root chips are, have been elevated to this like health food status. And a lot of things have, when you go to the produce department, even in, in uh, Walmart, you find chocolate covered almonds in the produce department and it's called produce on the label. So a lot of like chocolate is now produce, although, and it's sort of true, it comes from a plant. So here's a nice list. Bran, rice bran sneaks into a lot of these protein powders that people are using. So you might be eating rice bran and not even realizing it. Buckwheat, some people get hooked on it or eating it for breakfast every day or like it mixed into things like the soba noodles. Almonds are very bioavailable, full of many other plant toxins. Great way to wreck your gut and a big deal with oxalates. Peanuts are the other one that's really popular and used a lot and cashews. Those would be the, the worst three in the nuts. Uh, whole grains like the wheat berries, because it's the bran and the germ that tends to be more heavy with the oxalate. Interestingly though, breads, which we kind of moved past the produce department here, but we're looking at your list, uh, vary a lot. When we measure bread for oxalate content, you would think the whiter it is, the less oxalate, but it's more like the thinner it is. <laughs> the smaller the portion, it's a little hard to tell what's happening with the various types of wheat that they use to make bread. Same with corn, because corn on the cob is not high in oxalate, but corn grits and the corn we use for making corn chips tends to be high. They're very different varieties of corn when you can eat it fresh versus you're making a starchier kind of corn that maybe has more time to accumulate oxalate. We, there's just not enough research to explain why this variability in plants. But people make these gross generalizations that greens are bad for you, but it's not at all how it works. Nature is a lot more sophisticated than worrying about the color. Um, beans, especially black beans and pinto beans and the, the great northerns and navy beans that we used to make Boston baked beans, where they're all really high. Of course, the chocolate and cocoa, it's its the cocoa fraction that carries that oxalate. Uh, let's see, I'm just thinking about the rest of the produce department. It's, and then there's a few spices like the turmeric. It's Black pepper is fairly high. I have a friend who was really into these potato chips with black pepper on them, and then like a disaster. Not only it does the fat frying of potatoes seal in the soluble oxalate, which is the form that easily enters your bloodstream, and you lace it with black pepper for additional oxalate, 
but nobody throws any compensating vitamins on those potato chips, unlike the nasty breakfast cereals that we we know are deficient and bad, but we're pretending they're a real food. With potato chips, we all just sneak our potato chips as if we don't live on them every night. <laughs> so you can have a secret addiction to potato chips and really destroy your health on many levels because it's so nutritionally depleting and you're poisoning yourself with oxalate in the process. So I noticed on your list, you've got okra there. Luckily, okra isn't like a popular, <laughs> but it is a troublemaker as well. So yeah, and a lot of these whole, any whole grain, whatchamacallits tend to have the oxalate. And then we've got, um, you know, little weird things like rhubarb. Rhubarb is like people say, oh, rhubarb pie, rhubarb this. It's I always thought it was strange, but I find people have brought me rhubarb pies when they've been invited to my house. So Rhubarb is still around. <laughs> and that's sort of the textbook one where there's been a long history of children accidentally ingesting too much rhubarb and dying from, from rhubarb, from oxalate poisoning. Or after World War I, people in Europe, especially in England, were so desperate for fresh food that the government said, go ahead and eat your rhubarb leaves for greens. And several people died from that and got desperately ill on oxalate poisoning. And then they realized the amount of oxalate in a rhubarb leaf is so high that it absolutely should never, ever eat a rhubarb leaf. Can't hear you. I think of dates also. Dates are not quite so bad. Okay. Um, are they there's variable? There's a lot of lists out there that are incorrect. They, they haven't been tested and retested enough times to say how much of it is because there's different varieties or different seasons or variability. We don't know. You have to actually be able to test each variety and designate what variety you're testing and then repeat those tests over a number of years to see if there's any real variation in these plants and maybe source differently, grown differently. But that takes real money. You'd have to invest huge amounts of money in each food to get a real sense of how variable the oxalate content is. And it hasn't been done. When I think about the berries, it kind of makes sense because it seems like the berries or the kiwi, when you're eating a fruit and you're eating a lot of the seeds, that those seeds might come with oxalates. Like you said, the oxalates in kiwi are in a pectin layer. And in kiwi, you can't really separate it from the seeds. And I think of raspberries and blackberries, you can't separate it, the seeds out of those. And then I think of strawberries and the variability. Strawberries have all the little, little tiny seeds in them. And again, remember the, the framing of this conversation is that in someone who has an inflamed gut, you may absorb five to 10 times more oxalate. Um, people that don't have inflamed guts presumably might be able to eat a strawberry every once in a while or a few raspberries. But if you are sensitive to these things, this is why we're giving you this information so you can overlay it on your context, right? If your gut is already inflamed, these might be things to look out for, or maybe it's connected with other symptoms that you have. But I think of kiwis, I think of raspberries, I think of blackberries, I think of dates, I think of figs, but maybe dates are variable. Um, I have a story about chard. When I was uh, a vegan, a raw vegan, I, I, ran, a marath I ran a marathon in Portland. Uh, I ran the Portland Marathon. And I was so crazy that I brought my juicer, which was one of these hand crank metal juicers on the plane. And they see this thing in my luggage and it's all steel. And they pull it out and they go, is this a bong? I was like, no, it's a juicer. <laughs> I brought my hand crank juicer to Portland, Oregon to juice my chard. And I, I think I bought a bunch of chard and I juice and I never really liked juicing chard. Because every time I would do it, I would get like the back of my throat would just get stingy and, and raw. And I, I just, I have PTSD thinking about it today, how much wheatgrass I put in that stupid freaking juicer. I don't even know where that thing is now. I, I, it's like a, it was a really nice metal contraption that is worthless to me today. Um, but it, I used to juice wheatgrass and I hate that stuff now. And I would juice chard and I would juice spinach. And so I would just make these like oxalate juices. And I remember drinking this chard juice and just, I, sh I shudder now to think about it. I'm sure I'm still, you know, detoxifying and getting rid of all those oxalates. It's crazy to think about how much I, I must have ingested. It's really scary that nobody knows about this because it is easy to get into something like that now that produce is not seasonal anymore. And and, and rel relatively affordable. I think when I was growing up, blackberries and raspberries were so special. 
you know, you'd eat them like five at a time, three times a year. And that was the end of it, you know, or you'd be hiking in the summer down a wooded path where they're growing along a dirt road and you'd have a handful of them and that'd be the end of it. It wasn't something you put in a, a blender every single day, all year round. That's really getting us into big trouble. Yes, it is. I want to show a few articles just so people have some some stuff to kind of go on here if they want to research this more. Um, so I'll, I'll screen share some of these and we'll put them in the show notes. Total soluble and insoluble oxalate contents of ripe green and golden kiwi fruit. You can look at these analyses where I promise we are not making these things up, guys. Uh, this is all uh, substantiated with multiple, multiple papers. Here's a peanut oxalate uh, paper that I thought was pretty striking. Um, Peanut-induced oxalate nephropathy and acute kidney injury. Uh, these are case reports of peanut-induced oxalate. The guy in Japan. Yeah. Yep. Korean it's side. It's so interesting because, you know, peanuts is a Japanese food. <laughs> so, but, you know, our strange way of eating is global now. Yes, it is. And we go into grocery stores. And I was just thinking this, like, you know, like there are so many foods in the grocery store that, that probably need warning labels that, that we don't get. <laughs> Uh, well, interestingly, ever. we have in Richmond, where I am, there was a time when our uh, international Asian grocery store did have labels on the spinach saying, oh. if you have kidney problems, you probably should need a lot of this. Wow. And those for a while, because we've known this is a problem for over a hundred years. And it's just modern amnesia that has us ignoring this problem. Wow. This is oxalate inflammasome and progression of chronic kidney disease. This is a particularly interesting paper. It kind of connects oxalates with inflammation. A, a big deal in oxalate research. Uh, the, the le often in the name is often the last author because the publications, and you'll see he's written a tremendous amount of really great stuff. So if people wanted to dig in more, they could even just uh, search his name in PubMed and probably get a bunch of stuff on oxalates, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A couple more here. Just to show people, and I know I'm going to start breaking hearts, but I, I have to show you guys cinnamon, turmeric, and oxalates, which is something that I've shown in the past. I talked about this on the um, turmeric is bullshit video, guys. So that's a paper you guys can look at there. Yeah, and, and the researchers, there are researchers who complain about all this curcumin enthusiasm within the medical within the medical research community, like the bench scientists. We're all going nuts over curcumin and getting lots of money to public to study. But there are several researchers going, you guys are out of your minds. Your very technique you're using in the lab is tricking you into thinking you're doing something good here. It's really just a trick that your technique is faking you out. So all the supposed greatness is really questionable just at the bench science. Like they don't even know their technique and whether it's truly reflective of anything, in the body. So you can... And this is a case where you really do need human trials. And even uh, human trials are so fraught with too many variables that you can't control that there's so much wishful thinking to show something great about these products because you can patent them or you can make money on them or, you know, there's, it's, that's a whole nother conversation about what's wrong in research. You know, I wrote research grants and, and um, headed up as an administrator, a whole research program in the Department of Public Health. And. I can talk a long time about what's wrong with our research system. And if you look at the turmeric research, you guys, if you're interested in turmeric and curcumin specifically, go back to that controversial thoughts from last Friday. Um, uh, what Sally's referring to is this, this, this attribute of curcumin as a, a pans assay interference compound. It's sort right. of, it looks good in vitro. And then when you actually use it in trials, it's really pretty underwhelming in trials. In the video, I highlighted multiple uh, double blind placebo controlled trials with turmeric, many of which failed. Uh, it does show some benefits for osteoarthritis, but then again, it has all of the side effects associated with uh, compounds uh, like ibuprofen, which inhibit COX-1, COX-2, and 5 lipoxygenase. So go back to that video and suffice it to say that turmeric, specifically turmeric root, quite high in oxalates for this conversation. And then I definitely want to burst people's chocolate bubble a little bit here. I can't tell you how often people are like, you don't eat chocolate, but you know, the title of this paper is transient hyperoxaluria after ingestion of chocolate as a high risk factor for calcium oxalate calculi, which is basically saying, you get a lot of oxalate in your pee after you eat chocolate. Um, that's a big risk for calcium oxalate kidney stones. Do you want to mention anything about this paper? Two and a half or two and a third times. You see that 235% in there? 
Yes. That's really serious. That's a level of oxalate in the blood and in the urine that you see with the genetic disorder that tends to kill babies. Like people who are born with a genetic disorder where their livers are overproducing oxalate, they rarely make it out of childhood because the oxalate destroys their bodies completely. So you don't want to be at two and a third percent of, of a normal level of oxalate in your blood and urine after every snack and meal. This is the heart of the issue, though, because it's very easy to have a, that amount. That's not very much oxalate. It's like 65 milligrams of oxalate. This is not a ton of oxalate. 65 milligrams of maybe soluble oxalate is producing this huge surge of oxalate in the blood and in urine. And <laughs> you're eating way more than that when you have a spinach salad. And if you're doing these kinds of foods with every meal, you're basically creating a chronic low-level hyperoxaluria, which is a known way to destroy your bones, your vascular system, your kidneys, and so on. It's a disaster. And we've known it. And there's these many studies using chocolate, right? Because you can convince subjects to take some hot cocoa or a chunk of chocolate. That's an easy sell. And as you said, if you give them a few ounces of chocolate, you can create levels of oxalate in the blood that mimic this genetic disorder called primary hyperoxaluria. We can talk about what that is. It's a defect in one of the enzymes in the oxalate sort of metabolism pathway in the human body. There's actually 270 different forms of defects that occur in this disease. So there's lots of little ways that the genes get kind of messed up, but it's very rare, like less than 0.3%. Uh, you know, it's a very unusual disease to get. And the kids that get this, like you said, have massive problems. They often have these staghorn calculi, these kidney stones that are so complex that they fill the whole kidney or they fill the whole renal pelvis. They're like these, they look like antlers. They're such big kidney stones. They get deposition of oxalates throughout their body. They get what's called systemic oxalosis, right? I mean, it's a pretty serious condition. It's very rare, but it it's a genetic. It's very sort of telling for when what you can start happen. reading all that literature because you really get a sense of how this can work. And and those some of those folks. What's so valuable about that research is that every single case is unique. Every single person with that disease presents differently, and they they don't even start looking for it till after renal failure has occurred. So they haven't been watching the progression of the disease. You're really pretty late stage by the time the kidneys have ruined. Um, but not only are, is each one unique in how the symptoms show up and which symptoms they get and which body parts are affected, the same on the, uh, in the death knell for these folks is what, what takes them out or what they suffer from at the end is tremendously unique person to person. So it's the same illness. It's the same problem of too much oxalate in the body, but it produces this broad array, this diversity of presentations, which makes it an annoying condition. Like for any kind of oxalate poisoning, whether you did it with your diet or you have it genetically or some strange combination of both, you're not going to have a standard presentation. I've got a couple more articles here that I'll show. Um, this one is hypothyroidism and primary hyperoxaluria type 1, and they're looking at four patients, three months to 23 years, end-stage renal disease, symptomatic hypothyroidism, which is actually a great segue to yet another problem with oxalates, or at least a potential issue in terms of excess deposition of oxalate in the thyroid. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? I remember you and I talked a while ago about this autopsy series of patients. With, well, back with in the 1970s, there was a series of rat studies done shown that oxalate causes hypothyroidism and glandular underfunctioning generally. So the gonads, all these endocrine glands that produce hormones and so on to help run your body can get uh, in trouble, functionally unable to produce enough of the enzymes that you need for reproduction, for maintenance of a healthy uterus, for, you know, fertility and your, your growth hormones and especially the thyroid gland. Something like 85% of us, if we're over age 50, have frank microcrystals of oxalate. These are the ones you can see in a microscope, okay? They've gotten big enough that you can find them. 85%. What that has to mean is that the modern diet is way too high in oxalate. This is not, this is pathology. This is a big problem. When you see pathology in 85%, people should be concerned about it. And for some reason, we're not. 
And there's this this autopsy series that I'll put here, oxalate in the human thyroid gland, 97 fixed surgical thyroid specimens uh, were looked at for oxalate content, and they were everywhere. They were all, like the majority of them were full of oxalates, just scary stuff, right? And that's what you can see. You've got to understand oxalate starts off as a molecule that does damage with just an ion messing up your enzymes and your cell membranes, but then it starts... Forming when you get like eight or ten pairs of these ions or these calcium oxalate molecules is really where we're at. That can form a little notice we call a seed crystal. That is like a super nano nano crystal, and they're invisible, and they become bigger nano crystals, which are still invisible. And it's these nano level cell uh, crystals that have a tremendous amount of electromagnetic surface area to cause lots of problems with. The electromagnetics of membranes, whether it's the cell membrane, the mitochondrial membrane, you name it. And of course, it's messing. It causes what we call endoplasmic reticulum stress, which is another big thing that's popular to talk about now, because that's where calcium is stored in the cell is in the endoplasmic reticulum. And so oxalate tends to accumulate in the endoplasmic reticulum. In fact, in learning about the endoplasmic reticulum, scientists use oxalate in order to push calcium into it so you, they can uh, estimate the volume capacity of what, you know, to really understand the basics of cell biology. They use oxalate all over science to do evil things with calcium and torture cells so they can learn about the cell. They're, they're not noticing that there's something to learn about oxalate and the cell is a bad marriage. So why do, why do plants have oxalate? Like what is this doing in plants? Let's talk about its role in plants and, and let's frame it a little bit more and understand why it's even existing in plants. Very exciting. Uh, there's at least seven or eight designated, you know, theories about the different roles that oxalate plays for plants. One of them is that plants have to control calcium. All life has to be, needs calcium and needs to control it and have it in the right parts and the right amounts. And if soil is very heavy in calcium, especially for plants that don't need a lot of calcium, plants need a way to kind of control the calcium. So making oxalate, you can grab excess calcium and make these crystals and things as a way to just kind of set it aside. You also need to set aside calcium in your seeds because that becomes a great way to have dormant storage of calcium in a seed. And often seeds have a ring of calcium oxalate crystals around the outside of them. I've got a nice picture of one with raspberry seeds have the ring of the crystals. So when a seed starts to germinate, Enzymes start being able to break up the calcium and the oxalate. So the calcium ion is liberated as a cofactor for enzymes that build, uh, you know, amino acids and things as the germination process continues. And what you have left is the soluble oxalate. So if you're, if you're soaking your seeds, you may be liberating this storage molecule that allows the seed to have the calcium that it needs for growth later. So for growth, for self-protection, also, oxalates can be used to kill off um, funguses because the, the, the plants can turn it into, into um, hydrogen peroxide. So uh, I think that's one reason why strawberries vary so much, because strawberries are very low growing. They all lay down on the ground in the wet spring season, and all that mold from the earth puts a lot of mold pressure on strawberries. And I, I'm imagining that in wet seasons, the oxalate content of a strawberry would be higher versus years that it's very dry because they need more for, for controlling mold. And, and so there's a lot of obvious self-defense. And then plants lay out a matrix of amino acids in order to shape very specific crystals, the rapide being one, that double-pointed barb, that little arrow. I, I'd say that plants invented warfare because they invented the spear and arrow way before they were even humans or animals around. So they do these other things. They make these sort of disco balls that are um, thought to support plants that live in the understory where it's very dark and shady to, to grab every little photon of light and bounce it around inside the cell so it doesn't bounce off the, the leaf. So you can hold on to every little photon of light with these disco balls. Another reason oxalates help plants is because it allows the plant to sequester carbon. In the desert, a cactus plant has to close its breathing holes. and the bottom of the leaves, there's these stoma that allow for oxygen and CO2 to come into the plant. They use CO2 for carbon to build glucose. But in a desert 
environment, the air is so dry. If you left your stoma open, you just turn to dust. So during the day, you have to close your stoma, but you can't, now you can't breathe. So what you breathe during the day is calcium oxalate. You build oxalate has two carbons, and you can use that carbon as if it were carbon dioxide. So cactuses tend to be very high in oxalate. I find that fascinating. So the cacti are somehow using the oxalate to uh, become a building block uh, for the glucose in terms of some sort of photosynthesis or something. Yes, right. Because, you know, the, during the day is when the sunlight gets converted into energy and becomes glucose in the leaf. But if you don't have, if you can't breathe and you can't get carbon dioxide, you can't build the glucose. So you instead at night, is when you breathe and then you build your calcium oxalate crystals overnight. And then during the day, you break them down in order to make glucose. So it's like stored CO2 with oxalate. Do any animal foods have higher amounts of oxalates that you're aware of? I think that the seafood, especially tuna, has just a little bit of oxalate. Like a standard portion might have four or five milligrams, which is a lot for a plant or an animal food because most animal foods have one or less. There's actually a little bit in milk, but it wouldn't be a problem because A, it's so little, but B, there's so much calcium in milk, you're instantly protected from it. But in the sea mist, you see oxalate can spontaneously form from toxins in the air and with water vapor. So in heavily polluted air, the clouds make oxalate. And so remember the acid rain problem we used to have on the East Coast? We still have it. We just don't talk about it like we used to. Uh, that's some the major acid in acid rain is oxalate and it dissolves you know monuments and buildings and stones but in, in the sea mist i think the something about the you know how the the waves crash and little bits of water form this mist that is probably uh, generating a little bit of oxalate and some seafoods probably accumulated there's like one big giant nasty snail in asia that is so high in oxalate you could kill yourself but Mostly animal foods do not have oxalate. And I want to mention that we've talked all about exogenous oxalate, the oxalate that we get exposed to from food. There's a couple of other things that we can do with our food that could lead to higher levels of oxalate. Specifically, I'm thinking about excess glycine and excess vitamin C. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, there's uh, been arguments over the decades. So if you go just willy-nilly grabbing one or two research papers, you're going to hear everything all over the map. And most you're going to hear like, oh, oxalate only contributes like 10 from the diet. It's only this much. But the current research suggests that no less than 50% of the oxalate in your urine and blood is coming straight from your Swiss chard and peanuts and potatoes and food directly from oxalic acid you absorb. However, the body makes a little bit of oxalate, oxalic acid, in its metabolism, much of it coming from the liver. Remember, the genetic disorder is coming primarily from liver function. The liver is producing the oxalate in the genetic disorder. Exactly. So you've got these precursor molecules. Now, vitamin C, they're not completely sure if how much of it is enzymatic versus just spontaneous, because vitamin C can spontaneously turn into oxalate that's one of the ways that plants make oxalate. First, they make vitamin C, and they turn that into oxalate. And there, there's. I wish we could do a study to see how much vitamin C in pill form, just in the pill before you even take it, some of it's probably degenerated into a little bit of oxalate. So when we overtake vitamin C supplements, which is easy to do because your cells can only use so much. What can what the white cells and the cells that need C can do with C is only so much, and then all that extra just kind of hanging around in the blood can start to generating into oxalate. But the um, certain amino acids, hydroxyproline, proline, glycine, they're, they're kind of starting to downplay in some studies. I, there's still a lot of confusion around this. This is difficult stuff to study, and I don't think it's been a huge priority. But you need vitamin C, vitamin C, B6 to get the proper conversion back and forth between glycine. And if you get, if you don't have enough B6 or B1, some otherwise innocent molecules can more and more become this um, precursor to oxalate. What is it? Glycox, glycoxalate? Gly glyoxalate. Yeah. And so you get a buildup of glyoxalate, and then you're going to have more of that becoming oxalate in the body. 
And it, a lot, if you're really pushing gelatin, like in the rat studies, they used to use gelatin to create high oxalate in the kidneys, the hyperoxaluria condition, because enough gelatin can convert to oxalate to actually be significant. I'd say you'd have to be kind of big on kind of collagen powders to really overdo that. It's more the vitamin C, I think, is the more common problem where we're way overdoing, you know, 400 milligrams, like that's it. I mean, that's all your body can deal with in a whole day most of the time, unless you're in sepsis and you're really in meltdown mode. But taking a gram it isn't, isn't any better for you than taking 100 milligrams. And 100 might be appropriate if you never get C and if you do eat carbs or whatever. But we're, we have this thing about vitamin C and literally people have ruined their kidneys gotten seriously in trouble with oxalate. There's a couple of really interesting studies that show a few grams of C for eight days creates this lag where your oxalate levels in your urine go up after you stop taking the C. And that's a whole other concept that's hard for people to get their head around. So we've got lots of people megadosing on vitamin C because they're worried about COVID and then they're megadosing on zinc and then they're getting copper deficient, or you can actually get all sorts of deficiencies if you take a bunch of unopposed uh, zinc uh, without balancing it with copper. Basically, it's like um, certainly some of these supplements can be beneficial in an adjunctive perspective, from an adjunctive perspective in the setting of acute illness, but we should be really careful with them because a lot of them do have uh, downstream uh, implications. They certainly do. And I don't think doctors begin to appreciate that. And and the amount of sort of metabolic diversity, you know, how it's going to harm one person versus another is very variable, you know, and how much zinc you can stand or how much copper you can handle, you know, it's very individual based on where you are today. And a lot of mysteries in our biochemistry. There's a lot of things influence our biochemistry that we'll never understand. It's so complicated. And we do need more awareness about testing and knowing if people are harming themselves with supplements. Absolutely. And I wanted to just give one caution here um, to people because one thing that I have seen, and I, I, I will find it in the literature and put it in the show notes while we're talking, I'll pull it up in a moment. But I think that there is a small percentage of people who are um, sort of excess excretors of oxalate. Um, they're sort of like moderate hyperoxaluria. It's a very small percentage of people, and they tend to be calcium oxalate stone formers. And then these people, there does seem to be in the literature, at least I could find evidence, that in those people, when they go very, very high protein, so high meat in the diet, they, they can turn maybe excess amounts of that hydroxyproline or proline or glycine amino acids from the meat into calcium oxalate kidney stones. It's very rare from what I can understand, but I just want people to be aware of it because one of the, I think the best questions that I get asked sometime is who, who is an animal-based diet not appropriate for? And my answer is, well, people with chronic kidney disease. But I think that if you have a history of calcium oxalate kidney stones, you should be a little bit more cautious with the amount of protein in your diet just because of this phenomenon, that there's a very small amount of people who probably have some predisposition, maybe not to the level of primary hyperoxaluria, but who may have some predisposition to calcium oxalate kidney stones. And if you go to one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day, you may end up with kidney stones. I've heard it occasionally, but it's very rare. I think most people do well with that level honestly, of protein. honestly, though, Paul, that the science isn't really there yet to say much about mm. it. There's been several studies that show a high meat diet does really nothing to the oxalate levels in many people. And more right. what's affecting whether you're a stone former is a series of self-defense mechanisms that a healthy kidney normally has. In some small subset, like 12% of us, these don't work as well as they do in most of us. So there's three things that the kidney can do when there's too much oxalate coming into the kidney. And most of us do great at that. That's why high oxalate diets tend to not cause kidney stones in terms of like epidemiology, there's not a real difference because the diff it is the oxalate creating the kidney stone. The problem is that most of us can handle that because we have these defense mechanisms. It's just a few people who don't aren't up to this insane level of oxalate. And that's because their kidney tubules don't dilate really radically. This pretty new, um, Jacob Torres has, has led some studies on this that show that certain people 
don't dilate their tubules. So when the crystals start forming heavily in your kidneys, because all this spinach stuff is coming through, a lot of us have this ability to dilate our tubules, which will flush them out. These are the little collecting ducts in the kidneys where the urine is forming. And normally we can just flush them out and pee out a lot of cloudy urine. And if you can pee cloudy urine, that means that dilation process is working well for you. And I had cloudy urine for since forever. And no one ever said that's a sign that there's a lot of crystals in your urine. We should test to see if you have high oxygen. No one ever bothered to do that over 35 years of crystal urine. So that's a skill that a lot of that saves our kidneys for a lot of us. Another one is that your body can produce all these proteins. There's like 50 kinds of protein, maybe more, that the kidney produces, which glom on the calcium oxalate. Because a lot of proteins have calcium or they're sticky to calcium. Or, you know, if there's calcium on the protein, an ion of oxalate will stick there. So these proteins interfere with the building of calcium oxalate and the building of calcium oxalate crystals. So if you can produce enough of these proteins, again, you can pee out a fair amount of oxalate without it becoming stones in the kidney. The other thing is if you're getting enough minerals and enough citrate in your diet, the citrate keeps the pH in the correct place that really supports kidney function. And, and you can excrete more citrate with your urine higher citrate levels, again, prevent this crystallization process and keeps oxalate. Mostly oxalate we're peeing out is, is ionic oxalate and magnesium oxalate. And because the kidney is working hard and not have it be a lot of calcium oxalate and try to not have it be crystalline calcium oxalate. It's only people that have one of those three. Oh, there's another mechanism too, where the, when there's uh, calcium oxalate is forming and is sticking to the tubule cells, which it does, the cells will eat the crystal, right? Phagocytosis, they'll eat the crystal and they'll put it back in what we call the interstitial st space. So we, we're stashing oxalate back in the kidney tissues and you get this nephrocalcinosis if this keeps going on where the you get di diffuse calcification in the kidneys. You never see the kidney stones in a lot of these folks because that is a protective mechanism. Sequestering it, getting it out of the tubules protects you from blocking a tubule or some other, you know, highway where the kid, the liver, the um, urine is coming out of the body. So, you know, it's it's wrongheaded to think it's either the protein or the oxalate or whatever. No, no, no. It's a combination of how your physiology is doing in this toxic environment of too much stuff in the wrong pH and the wrong, you know, uh, biochemical environment that makes you prone to stones. But it's surprising how few of us get kidney stones, and that's a miraculous kidney that we have. Yeah, it's an incredible, it's an incredible thing. So you mentioned a couple of things that I want to highlight for people, and this is kind of part of the discussion of how you can protect yourself from these, because we're all going to get a little bit in our diets. I mean, I'm sure there's a little bit of oxalate in my banana or my papaya, and occasionally I'm going to eat a date. to handle a certain amount. Yeah. But in, you and know, so, from the diet, it's really only about 15 milligrams of oxalate you're designed to handle. If you absorb 10% from your diet, that's 150 milligrams in your diet. Your banana might have eight milligrams, so you're fine, right? Mm -hmm. No biggie. And then, so my impression is that when there is adequate calcium in the diet, the absorption of oxalates is lower. Is that correct? That's right. So people might want to think about, this is yet another reason. I did a controversial thoughts a long time ago about the need for calcium in the human diet. I think that there's a lot of perspectives on this. Some people don't think that we need calcium in the human diet, but I, I see this as a compelling argument for this. There's a lot of models uh, of colon cancer in, in murine models, mice and rats, that look at calcium deficient uh, models in order to generate tumors and adenomas. And so calcium, at least in the animal models, does seem to be protective at the level of the gut against precancerous lesions. And the oxalate thing is yet another um, reason that, um, or, or evidence or instance where calcium in the diet it appears to decrease the absorption of oxalates. So people might want to think about getting either a dairy but product, if you can tolerate dairy. It's sort or of an analogy to like the more carbs, the more C you need, you know, like the more plants you eat, the more calcium you need. But we definitely need calcium. Calcium deficiency is a great way to turn on all kinds of disease processes in the body. It's not good to be starved of calcium. So, yeah. And it's interesting like for me. Oxalate will that. bind to calcium. You won't absorb it but you also don't absorb the oxalate. That's why 
it, we, we take calcium to help reverse this condition as a magnet to help the body release oxalate. You know, we, we want calcium just hanging around in the gut. Just having calcium hanging around in your intestinal tract is good for you. Yeah, that's a really important point to stress here. And so if people can tolerate dairy, great. I'm someone that doesn't tolerate dairy. I've tried so many ways. I want to eat cheese. I want to eat goat's milk yogurt, but it just seems to trigger me immunologically. So I just do bone meal. I do our bone matrix supplement from Hard and Soil, but I think that bone meal or other sources of calcium. Have you seen anything else with your clients other than just a straight calcium supplement? Any well, other ways? That interestingly, you can on a low oxide diet, a lot of us who couldn't tolerate dairy now can, but obviously you're not on a high oxalate diet and you still can't. Um, I find that, you know, I hate the word dairy because that's like saying food. It's, there's so many kinds of dairy, you know, there's like processed commercial Holstein dairy, and then there's raw dairy from local grass fed Amish farms. And then there's uh, fermented dairies. And I think the, the easy one for most people to digest is aged cheeses because the cheese making process has so transformed that casein that it's, it's quite a different set of proteins, really, if it's been long age versus these soft, smushy cheeses, which are kind of young. And even yogurt is sort of young. It's not a really serious fermentation. It's just kind of acidifying it. And, and so it, if you're curious to experiment with dairy, I would start with like an aged cheddar or an aged Gouda and small amounts of that and kind of titrate up and just see if you have tolerance for that. Because the calcium about in cheese is so valuable and the other nutrients too. What about Parmigiano Reggiano? Is that yeah, one aged? That's a great example of an aged dry cheese that seems to be very well tolerated. Maybe I'll try it again. I'm always, I've done the dairy experiment so many times. But start Maybe I'll just little, like... just to get your system used to it again. You know, a yeah. teaspoon here and there for a couple of days. Yeah, 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 but some sort of calcium. Um, maybe let's segue into a discussion of oxalate dumping, and this is kind of related because you mentioned citrate and some of these other things. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about citrate. Dietary sources of citrate, anything you can think There's of? or just Really, like... lemon juice is the best one, mm -hmm. lemon juice. And okay. we use that therapeutically. I consider lemon juice Rx number one. Like if you're, anything's bothering you, go juice a lemon, and it can really help. <laughs> Like, I don't care what's wrong with you, juice a lemon. And, and the amount of vitamin C in a lemon is so reasonable. It's like 30 milligrams, you know, it's like mm -hmm. right there in a physiologic level. And then and this is a case where some flavonoids might actually not be so bad. Um, <laughs> but the, the citrate in the lemon is really a powerful kidney stone dissolver and really supports good uh, pH. You know, some of it turns into bicarb in the liver and really supports your kidney health. And I think vascular, as is, citrates are really helpful to have around. And so lemon juice is a nice source of citrate. Great. And then let's talk about oxalate dumping because we have years and years and years of eating almonds. And I was a raw vegan for seven months and ate everything raw almond and tons of raw kale and lots of raw spinach. And I'm sure I had years and decades of oxalate accumulation in my body prior to that. Um, when it starts to come out, people can sometimes have problems when the ox, like the body starts to kind of mobilize it. It seems like any, any thoughts, you know, briefly, obviously I want people to check out your work for more of the details on this, but any thoughts about how people should think about oxalate dumping or can mitigate it or slow it down or this is a deal with really the important concept for people to get because, okay, so it's invisible crystals all over the place. You don't know about, and you may have had very few symptoms and then you quit eating oxalate and it's winter time. Right. Because in the old days of the hunting, remember the caveman and his, you know, skin for coats, he was hunting all winter long and fishing and not eating spinach smoothies. Right. And so every winter, no matter how many raspberry patches he hit in the summer, he was going to kind of release that. The body's like seasonally going to adjust for the mistakes you made in the oxalate summertime. But now we don't have winter. We don't have meat only seasons. We have high oxalate cinnamon and chocolate and pies all winter long and potatoes. Turmeric all and almonds. Place. And the potato yeah. is only a 400 years and humans have been messing around with potatoes. It's not, a, you know, it's just not what you think it is. It's not like humans have always lived on white potatoes. So this, um, what happens with modern people is you may have two, three, four, even five decades 
of oxalate accumulation. That's why 85% of us have oxalate crystals in our thyroid gland. If you're 50, you have an 85% chance of just your poor thyroid gland, let alone your bones and everything else. When you quit eating it, the body's like, takes about five days to start equipping cells with the ability to start getting rid of this oxalate. And if it's a sudden precipitous drop into like carnivore after going vegan or keto bread crazy, a lot of people go to keto and it doesn't work that well. And then they go to carnivore and there's a subset of people who go to carnivore and they stick it out for a while waiting for the miracles to happen. And they don't, and they keep having health problems. And that's probably because their oxalate levels will go up on a carnivore diet in their blood and in their urine, because now your bones and your thyroid and all this tissue is like, woohoo, it's winter. We're going to get rid of this stuff. And it starts pouring oxalate back into the bloodstream. And it's more toxic than it was when it was coming in because it's, it's coming from inside tissues and inside cells. The level of damage that has to go on to get this stuff out is profound and you can get sicker while your body is cleaning this stuff up. This is a pretty brutal kind of reworking the road surfaces where the guys with the jackhammers are out digging up the roads. That's your body. The jackhammers are your immune cells spewing acids and proteases at these crystal deposits and causing collateral damage. And a lot of these oxalates are getting dissolved from inside these liposomes, inside cells. You're releasing ions into a cell. Now, cell runs on little calcium sparks, little calcium ions inside the cell, little electrolytes happening around mitochondria. When you release the ion from inside the cell, the cell can go to hack and die. So the release process can make you quite sick. So we, all, we usually advise people if they know they have a history of a lot of keto bread and spinach and potatoes and peanuts and chocolate, that you actually don't want to go all the way to full like hard carnivore real fast. Uh, <laughs> it takes some time. Some people need a six month transition period where you leave some of your chocolate in your diet. You leave a little bit of plantain chips here and there, or what, a little bit of tea, a clementine here and there. Like we need, maybe might need as much as 50 to even 150 milligrams a day in the diet just to, to reduce the enthusiasm for this winter. Like the cells want to unload this stuff, but you have to reduce that overzealous release process so you don't make yourself sick. That makes sense. And then, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the same thing is true, I think, with fiber for people. Sometimes people transition to straight carnivore with zero fiber and they get GI stuff and adding a little bit of fiber back helps with the transition. So, yeah, I think that's that's a great that's a great thing. And then do you sometimes, you said you sometimes add calcium citrate or other supplements or magnesium citrate, or you can juice a lemon and have calcium in your diet. Probably all those things will help with that process. Very much so. Uh, calcium, however, does encourage the clearing. You need the calcium to help mm. carry it away. You need the calcium because you're depleted in calcium. Most of us are calcium deficient because we eat too many oxalates and you really need calcium citrate is incredibly helpful. Although I take calcium pyruvate because I find calcium citrate constipating. I still have some leftover kind of motility issues where I have to use a little mag citrate, but mag citrate is really well tolerated. Both calcium and magnesium support brain relaxing. I like to have people take that at bedtime, but you remember a dominant form of oxalate coming out of the kidneys is magnesium oxalate. So the more magnesium you have to throw away in your urine, the better. And also with this sort of mayhem where oxalates hanging around and around muscles and bones, you can be losing a lot of potassium in the process of oxalate clearing. And I find a lot of people do well on more potassium and like to use potassium citrate again. So th these supplements, those three dominant sort of macro minerals come in citrate form. So you can get both your citrate and your minerals, which alkalize and solve a lot of problems and getting enough salt, obviously, because salt is the other electrifying electrolyte that helps the cells work. When I was um, looking at some of my old papers, I came across this one, which I thought was pretty interesting. Have you seen much on dysbiosis and hyperoxaluria? I thought this was quite interesting that, that oxalates in the gut could actually change the gut microbiome. No question that they do. Yep. In lots of different ways. I mean, for one thing, it, the 
organisms that like to eat oxalate, if they get too much, they start dying. <laughs> like it's ironic, exactly. like eating too much oxalate kills the bacteria that eat oxalate. I and mean, it's not a good diet to have. You wouldn't want to be reincarnated as an oxalate eating bacteria. I promise you it's a bad life. <laughs> like, don't go there. But what we see is a lot of terrain problems with oxalate. It creates a lot of acidosis. Remember the oxidative stress that oxalate causes, it creates acidosis, especially on this clearing path, you know, this with this dumping, you get a fair amount of acidosis that gives you a certain amount of malaise. But acidosis promotes path, pathogens and, you know, collateral stuff like candida, yeast infections. A ton of my clients had a long history of problems with various infections and nothing worked. No amount of monostat, no amount of drugs will touch these infections. But when you go low oxalate, all of a sudden, these infections start resolving. And sometimes you'll get um, an old stuff coming out of the system. You might get cold sores. You might get what looks like athlete's foot or something. These are stuff being pushed out with the crystals coming out of the body. And then you just need like a little tea tree oil or something and you're done. And suddenly you are not prone to these infections at all. Really serious ones, biofilm type infections. Some people start you know, pooping out all these biofilms and all this stuff just starts coming out. You, you can go through a period with oxalate clearing where your whole body smells horrible. And there's all kinds of stuff coming out. And it's probably because there's so many of these little latent infections hanging around in the body on these crystals because the crystals form these granulomas, which tend to attract and harbor infections. So there's a really tight relationship between problems with chronic infection and oxalate. So, yes. That is, that's so fascinating. And there are so many of these things I've heard of recurrent urinary tract infections, recurrent yeast infections in women. And the other one that I always hear about is candida. And people will say, oh, you have candida, you need to stop eating sugar. And I think that doesn't really work long term because as soon as you add any sort of carbohydrate back, it just comes back. I'm always thinking there must be something else. And so I love this as like one of the forgotten pieces of a healthy microbiome is probably not having a lot of oxalates in your diet. And never have I heard anyone who claims to be a guru in the microbiome space talk about that aspect of it, that, that this is, it's all connected, right? But I did a little post on my Instagram about probiotics. And I was just saying that before you start putting probiotics into your gut to fix your gut, make sure you have your diet figured out because there are lots of things in your diet that could be harming the gut, like lectins, which cause inflammation in the gut, which can lead to increased absorption of oxalates and oxalates, which themselves can lead to dysbiosis and changes in infections. Like we're talking about little micro infections or occult infections or biofilms or this recurrent candida. And this is like, I think the forgotten piece, people just want to throw more probiotics at it without correcting the root causes. And it's just so interesting to me that this is one of the forgotten elements of a healthy microbiome and whether it's GI or skin or vaginal or whatever microbiome. And it's, it's so often overlooked. I've not really heard many people talk about it, but that's so interesting. Yeah, Cause it doesn't actually doesn't get its fair share of, you know, research and talent. So a lot of this is just laying on the table. And the way we have to design these studies is very simplistic, like A and B. And so with a lot of even this complicated stuff about looking at the my, the, the gut microbiome and all of that, it, it's still simplistic. And it, so much more comes out of real life, like working with actual people and living through this oxalate poisoning thing. It's like your body is telling you how it works and doesn't work. And there's so much data there that we ignore because we collect them together as a series of case studies. Then it's, oh, that's antidote. But if we set it up as a double blinded trial, somehow that's not, even though that is artificially and it's skewed and it's got problems, we don't let our real life experience really teach us. So that happens in our own lives. We can be following this perfectly healthy diet for decades because we think it can't be the diet. It's the perfect diet. And so we miss the boat. We miss connecting that what we're doing is connected to the problem. And I can only imagine that evolutionarily, ancestrally, we would just not have had as much exposure to these foods. Like you said, raspberries, blackberries, figs would have been a rarity. Um, maybe in tropical climates where there's more fruit the fruits are not as high in oxalate uh, and well, we certainly fruits I don't think... didn't exist then I and mean, we've yeah. invented all of them so people think the produce department is required but we just invented most of them in the last 400 years 
And I don't think our ancestors were going around eating a lot of salads. I, I definitely don't think they were eating much spinach unless they were frankly starving. I've talked about this all the time when I was in Tanzania with the Hadza. They were not out eating plant leaves ever. <laughs> they don't eat a lot of seeds unless they're starving. I just don't think that a lot of these high oxalate foods, beans, grains, nuts, would have been a large portion of the human diet. Uh, you can talk about the ikung with the mongongo nut, but that's a whole separate issue. And I think that that's an evolutionary inconsistency. I think that the ikung eat a lot of the mongongo nut today because a lot of their hunting grounds are encroached upon and they're not eating necessarily an ancestrally appropriate diet. But other hunter-gatherer tribes, there's really no evidence of excess consumption of a lot of foods that I can think of that, that would have had lots of oxalates. I think chocolate's a recent invention. Uh, they just, they just, I don't think we would have been exposed to these things. And yet you walk into Whole Foods and so many of these high oxalate foods are celebrated as health foods and people just unknowingly with the best intentions end up in a position where they're potentially putting a lot of this compound in their body and it can be very damaging for them. So it's a super important conversation. I'm so Do you, glad you um, wanted to talk about oxalates. <laughs> I know, right? Do you did, did did we cover everything? Is there anything else you want to say as we wrap up here? I feel like we gave people a pretty good tour through the oxalate uh, morass. Um, anything yeah, else you I, want to say you know, before we wrap up? People still struggle with their culture bound notions. You know, it's a real inner struggle for people. Like they're so committed to the idea that the produce aisle is benevolent and benign and wonderful and that you need this stuff. And there's a lot of fear mongering out there. Dietitians will say, oh, if you don't eat spinach, you're going to eat a deficient diet. That is the worst bunk. And people fall for that. The beautiful thing about ancestral thinking is it's simple. Look, we were hunters. We ate a bunch of meat most of the time. In wintertime, we ate all meat for sure. And that worked, period. And if you can't fit that into your modern concepts of health and well-being, then you're you're not getting it. So you need to work on that concept. Once you have that, you can just filter the BS and get over some of this fear-mongering out there and not be so worried about, oh, a life without spinach will not be worth living. <laughs> You know, someone sent me a message today on Instagram and said, you know, you, you, Paul, recommend organs and meat for mental health because of the nutrients and those foods. And there's another psychiatrist that I want to have on the podcast soon who's written a whole book. And, and he also recommends organs and meat for mental health because of the nutrients in them. But he then has a list of a bunch of plant foods. And, and these are the plant foods that he recommends for mental health. And I think people get so confused when they see all of this conflicting nutritional thinking. And I love what you said there, because for me, I just like to let people bring it back to simple thinking. But we're so far removed from ancestral principles, from anthropology, from paleoethnography. And we don't understand how our ancestors lived. But when you think about it, all of these plant foods that this guy had listed as the best plant foods for mental health, kale, things like this, these are things we would never have eaten as humans. That, you know, and the whole the whole reason he was listing them as mental health foods was because they had reasonable amounts of B vitamins like folate or EPA or DHA and things you can easily get from animal foods in much more bioavailable forms and much more uh, much larger absolute amounts. But he was saying in the plant world, you know, kale is a superfood for mental health, and I'm thinking. That's completely missing the content. That doesn't, that's not evolutionarily consistent at all. It makes no sense. And I think it ends up hurting people because we talked about spinach and chard in this podcast. And from an Oxley perspective, kale isn't the biggest villain, but I have other issues with kale for other I reasons. I have that lots of about. issues with the low oxalate vegetables. The whole, right. most of what's in the produce aisle that's low oxalate is the cabbage family. And they're all right. high in rabinose and funky fibers and stuff that you don't digest well. And it creates a fair amount of colon mayhem. And, and half your brain is in your gut. You really don't do well, especially if you're doing them raw, like, you know, coleslaw or something. Um, not good. And if you are eating them, you have to have really reasonable portions. And when you go low oxalate, it's really easy to, like, pile up with three vegetables and they're all from the cabbage family. And suddenly you're eating mountains of this ravenous and other junk that's in them. And that's what actually moved me all the way to carnivore. It's like I was starting to live on cabbage family plus meat and it wasn't working. And it became really clear when I piled up on a Thanksgiving with extra vegetables, because that's what makes Thanksgiving abundant, right? Is all these, so I was, you know, I had all these roasted ones and mashed ones and this and that. And I was so sick for the next three days just from overeating the cabbage family. And that woke me up to like, uh oh, you can't, you still can't stay in love with piles of vegetables and think that's abundance and 
beneficent and, and good for your health. And so that by listening to my body, I eventually caught on, got a little smarter, took a while. <laughs> and this is the reason that, you know, there are some foods in the middle of the animal based infographic in terms of toxicity. And that's why sweet potatoes are there because sweet potatoes have some oxalates and stuff. And I put roots in the middle, you know, the, the green side of the animal based infographic is all is almost entirely fruit and things that are meant to be lower oxalate. So it gets a little tricky. Yeah. And you fruits guys have tend to have crystals more uh -huh. than oxalate ion, you know, the oxalic acid. So fruits generally, and they might be a little kind of glassy and a little rough, but they have enough pectin and other fibers that kind of protect you from the crystals in the fruit. So I really don't think, you know, except for the fact that seeds and skin and fruit like the berries, I think can actually be a little allergenic or a little bit rough. Um, fruits generally, I think, are the least toxic forms of the oxalate, which is interesting because I do think fruits and meat were kind of like human foods. Yes. Exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself. And I think that the fruits, especially that don't have a lot of seeds in them right. are probably the fruits to prefer even. But if you guys have questions about that animal-based infographic, you can always email us at heart and soil, radical health at heart and soil .co. They'll walk you through it. So Sally, thank you so much for coming on the podcast again. This is amazing. I think this is going to help a lot of people. I'm super appreciative of the work you do. Where can people find more of your stuff and support you? Thank you. It's really lovely to be with you. I, it's, I love it. And please check out my website, which is sallyknorton.com. You can get a PDF of if you still want to eat plant foods, there's tons of them in my cookbook. You can learn how to cook with these cabbage family and other vegetables that are low. And if you're wanting to do that, that might be a good place to start. We're I'm just re starting up group classes again. You can sign up for a group class. You can check me out on Instagram. And those are the primary ways you can reach out to me. So the website is sallyknorton.com? That's correct. And okay. on Instagram, it's sknorton. All right. You got a TikTok? That's like my newest thing. I got to get there. It. I got to get there. <laughs> I'm coming. I'm going to get there. It's the worst thing ever, but uh, if we can, if, if, if it allows us to reach more people and maybe do some good videos, some is a whole other level of file handling and things that I have to get like the mental leap to it's deal wild. with. It's wild. But, okay, great. Well, <laughs> I hope that you and I can eat some steaks and other low oxalate food very soon. Thanks oh, again for coming yes. on.